Kelsey, I feel like we were destined to interview our guest today. Maybe it could just be good timing or even just luck. Well, as good luck would have it, we have the incredible opportunity to talk with Emily St. John Mandel today. Emily St. John Mandel is the author of six novels, including The Glass Hotel, which was selected by President Barack Obama as one of his favorite books of 2020, and Station Eleven, which was a finalist for a National Book Award and the Penn Faulkner Award, and won the 2015 Arthur C. Clarke Award, among other honors. Station Eleven has been translated into 33 languages and was recently released as a limited series on HBO Max. Her latest novel, Sea of Tranquility, will be released April 5th. She lives in New York City with her husband and daughter. And for all the librarians out there, I love this part of your bio. Emily's middle name is St. John, so the books go under M. Welcome to the first 50 pages, Emily. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So we are not going to ask you what it's like to be the author of a pandemic novel during a pandemic. But for, you read Sea of Tranquility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But for anyone who hasn't read Station Eleven, it is a compelling, lyrical, character-driven, non-linear, haunting, moving, and suspenseful literary science fiction novel published in 2014 that happens to take place around a pandemic apocalypse. But here we are eight years and a global pandemic after Station Eleven was published. And there is this interesting mix now of readers, those who read the novel before and those who are reading this book now, experiencing it through a different lens of this current time. And those readers who are going back to reread it, and for really everyone, it's resonating in a very emotional way with readers. So I guess my question, if I can get to my question, <laughs> do you pay attention to how readers react to your novels? Or once it's out in the world, do you have to let it go? You know, a little bit of both, honestly. I do pay attention because I'm kind of intermittently on Twitter. You know, I'll leave for months and then come back for a few weeks and then remember why I left and leave again. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I do see those reactions. And I do care. Um, at the same time, there's really nothing I can do about it. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. once the book's published and out in the world, um, sure, I'll read your complaints about the book, but there, there's really not much I can do. So I do feel a level of detachment at the same time as caring, if that makes sense. I, I guess it's a bit of a paradox. And I would have to imagine, because readers have such an emotional uh, resonance with the story, that you probably get both ends of the spectrum you know there are people yeah. who are you know have tattoos now that are you know a phrase from station you know because survival is insufficient you can google that and there are people with these tattoos so it's definitely affecting um and then there are people who don't get it, don't care what, you know, they, there's there's mm -hmm. both ends of that. So yeah, absolutely. And they're all on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, I, uh, if, to be clear, like the, the overwhelming majority of responses I get have been positive, which has just been incredible. And I feel so fortunate. The tattoos are extraordinary. I have to say, the first time I encountered a Station Eleven tattoo, it was an event in a bookstore in Tennessee. And this woman just came up to the front of the signing line and pulled up her sleeve and there was survival is insufficient for the novel I just published. And it was the most incredible thing just to have the experience of writing something fictional and then somehow all of a sudden it exists in front of you in the world at a bookstore in Tennessee. That was just, yeah. that was incredible. Um, so yeah, th those responses are immensely moving to me. So Book Riot recently posted a list of the most influential science fiction novels of all time. And Station Eleven was on their list alongside Mary Shelley, H.G. Wells, George Orwell, Ray Bradbury, Margaret Atwood, Octavia Butler. The list goes on and on. Um, what is it that has drawn you to write in the science fiction genre? There was a period of time when I was a teenager when that was the only genre I read. So... It was something that I was just naturally drawn to at a really early age. When I did, my family had no money, but we did have library cards. So I got to read a ton of books. And yeah, I just remember spending a ton of time going over the shelves in the library, 
just collecting all the sci-fi books I could find. And at this point, I don't know that I could name very many of them. You know, I have vague memories of research stations and post-apocalyptic worlds, like that kind of thing. I know there was a lot of Isaac Asimov. Um, but yeah, it, it's just a genre I've always loved. I guess maybe uh, there's something in that genre about going to the very furthest bounds of imagination that I, that I think really appeals to me. So... My first several books were not in that genre. I was uh, was drawn more toward crime fiction for a while, but but yeah, with Station Eleven, there was a sense of coming back to this territory that I used to know really well and that I really love. Sure. Do you think there are you know other elements that you know really draw readers to these stories? Whether it's hope for the future, our fear of creating the very thing that will destroy us, you know, longing for stories that remain over time. I think all those things, maybe, maybe depending a little bit on the individual reader and also on the book, um, there's something there's something inherently utopian about any book where people leave this planet, is my feeling. That, you know, in my new novel, Sea of Tranquility, there are people living in this moon colony. There is no suggestion that that's a democracy. And in fact, there are kind of intimations of some somewhat authoritarian creepiness happening there. At the same time, though, that's a future that is not a post-apocalyptic wasteland. That's that's kind of the future of Star Trek, where, you know, the future wasn't a catastrophe. The future was the Federation of Planets. And that there's something very inherently hopeful in that that I think I think I'm drawn to personally, and I'm sure other people are too. But then, of course, uh, sci-fi or speculative fiction, it encompasses such... And well, kind of an infinite range of possible futures. And of course, you know, the flip side of that is something like The Road or the uh, the first and middle sections of Walter Miller's novel, A Canticle for Leibowitz, where it is this wasteland and hope is at least temporarily lost. And I don't know if for some readers there's an element of perhaps soothing our own anxieties by reading about futures that are just so much worse than, than yeah. anything that most of us are living mm -hmm. through. So yeah, I think it depends on the book and on the reader. We are definitely excited to talk about Sea of Tranquility, but I, I would like to ask one more question for you about Station Eleven. Yeah, sure. When you reflect on writing Station Eleven, what ideas or themes do you hope will endure for readers over time? It's a tricky one because as a reader, I've always kind of resented books that I felt had a message in them. Like, you know, that thing where you're reading a novel and you're enjoying it. And then this sort of authorial message sledgehammer comes down in your head and you're like, whoa, that was yeah. the message of the book. Like, I've, I've always really disliked that. Yeah. <laughs> so I've tried to resist writing books that have one message that I want people to definitely take away. I will say that something I was personally thinking about when I was writing Station Eleven was the incredible fragility of civilization. There's just so much that we don't think about because we don't have to, and that we therefore take for granted, like the availability of antibiotics and insulin or air travel, or even something like electricity, that incredible thing where you walk into a room flip a switch and the room's filled with light or yeah. the supercomputers we carry in our pockets that we call yeah. phones. So yeah, I, I was thinking about how fragile all those systems are. And I don't know that I'd want to make that too prescriptive, but that will probably come through, I think, to a lot of people reading the book. Thank you. Sure. In 2020, you published The Glass Hotel, which was another amazing and award-winning book, but you know, maybe it was a little bit more magical realism than science fiction but also told from a multiple perspectives viewpoint with complex and flawed characters. Can you talk a little bit about your character development and what that process is like for you in your writing? And kind of, we want to know as avid fans of yours, like how do you create characters that are so interesting that we can't help but keep wanting to read about them? <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, I pay a lot of attention to character development I think because when I first started out writing fiction, my personal feeling was that character development was my weakest skill. It was something that I felt I really had to work on. For me, the process of developing hopefully realistic and complex and interesting characters, 
is the same as everything else in the novel, which is just endless revision. Like, honestly, there's nothing romantic happening. <laughs> like, no, no big secret. I, um, I write without an outline. So what that means is that my first draft is just an incredible mess. And I've come to think of the first draft as not really the book. It's more like the block of raw material in which I'll find the book. And, you know, to strain that analogy all the way to its outer limit, like if I were a sculptor, the uh, the book is the sculpture that's hiding inside the block of first draft wood. <laughs> so I, um, yeah, I just revise over and over and over again. And anything that's good, like any kind of, continuity or beauty or clarity or decent character development that just comes from just going over the material again and again and again and sometimes it takes a really long time um the glass hotel took five years to write and that was mostly revision so yeah it's just this kind of grinding process which i also love even though it's sometimes not fun at all um and then with character development specifically I'm trying to make them, I guess I'm just trying to make my characters a little bit complicated in that, you know, in the, so for example, in the glass hotel, there's this con man, Jonathan Alcatus, his crime is the same as Bernie Madoff's crime. Uh, Madoff, of course, had that Ponzi scheme that collapsed in 2008, but Madoff himself was the most incredibly uninteresting character where I know we shouldn't speak ill of the dead, but if anybody deserves it, it's that guy. If you, uh, you know, if you read his interviews from prison, he's just such a garden variety sociopath. Like there's just nothing that interesting happening there. So then the challenge with that character, who I'm mentioning because he's possibly the hardest character I've ever had to write, was how can I have this guy commit this terrible crime that ruins hundreds or thousands of lives? but not have him be this kind of two-dimensional mustache twirling Disney villain. You know, it's uh, <laughs> like there's gotta be some balance in there. There had to be something about him that was good. So what I was thinking of with him in particular was um, his friendship with his sort of quasi wife, Vincent. They're not actually married, but they pretend to be. And they are actually good friends. It's, it's a somewhat mercenary trophy wife situation, but they do genuinely enjoy each other's company. And then also he truly loved his first wife, Suzanne. So for me, that speaks to a larger philosophy of character development, which is just how can I, how can I complicate things? How can I make these characters a mix of good and evil in a way that hopefully gestures toward reflecting you know, the way people really are? And they come through as incredibly human, you know? I mean, good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we were fortunate to have advanced reader copies of your latest novel, Sea of Tranquility. And I have to say that I have been really obsessed with this book for the last Thank week. You. I am kind of a slow reader by choice, but I really found myself carving out time in my day to get back to the book. And the joy of reading this book for me was that I stopped trying to figure it out. I, I just read for the joy of reading, and I went along for the ride, letting the story unfold. And it was such a rewarding experience for me. I really, Thank really you. loved the book. And, I, and I've been telling everyone about it, and then they ask me, what is it about? And I'm still trying to figure out how to explain <laughs> it. <laughs> the elevator pitch is so hard sometimes, yes. right? <laughs> so yeah. um, I, I'm going to ask you, Emily, how would you describe Sea of Tranquility to our listeners? Thank you so much for asking, because as you spoke, I realized where you were going with that question and realized I've yet to come up with the elevator pitch. <laughs> so, okay, here goes. Um, sea of Tranquility is a novel that moves through time and space from 1912 on Vancouver Island to the year 2400 in a moon colony. And it's concerned, gosh, how do I say this without making it sound really pretentious? Um, it's concerned with questions of um, time travel, art, consequence, responsibility, and the possibility that we're all living in a simulation. <laughs> so yeah. I need to work yeah. on this, as you can see. <laughs> that's, that's, that's well, good. and it is a complicated kind of storyline, but it it is rewarding. The more you get through the book, the more like your faith in the story is rewarded. Like, you know, Thank it's you 
You know that it's going somewhere. Like, you know, um, you know, you, I just want to say, like, keep reading because, you know, it's, it is um, complicated, but the characters and the dialogue are really just incredible. And um, I feel like kind of like Station Eleven, there is also this idea around those things that endure, right? Because we're going into the future, 2203. Yeah, with the last I, book tour on Earth. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so one of the things, if I can ask you, so there's a quote on the wall that you mentioned, and I think just because of your revision process, it has to be very intentional. Um, it's a great life if you don't weaken. So then, of course, I had to, I'm like, well, does this come from something else? And did it come from a song? Is that a spoiler? It's, no, that's not a spoiler. Um, it's one of those phrases that I've been aware of for years, but I've seen attributed to like four different people. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, I finally, I finally looked it up and it's from a novel, which, you know what, I don't have the book in front of me, but this is in the acknowledgments. Um, I want to say it was written in approximately 1919 by a Scottish author okay. named, I want to say John Buchan or John Buchanan. I can't remember which, but yeah, it's just one of those wonderful kind of, just one of those wonderful lines that feels so applicable to almost any life. You know, it's, yeah. it's a great life if you don't weaken. And yeah, it's just always stuck with me as something that feels true. You know, I think there is, and you maybe have talked about this in a previous interview, the things that will endure over time is kind of random and unpredictable, right? Yeah, so, it, it is. And, yeah, I am. Um, sorry, go ahead. No. And so there are some things like we're in the future and it feels almost very present um, especially some of the attitudes, which <laughs> I thought was an interesting play on some of those women in the workforce. I, yeah. I, I was like, why are we still talking about that? Why is this still a thing in 20, mm -hmm. you know, 2203? And I'm like, well, yeah, because what are we doing now? You know, it's just like, yeah, exactly. went down this it's whole line of, of thinking about why this has endured and why is this still a thing? And, um, but yeah. It was, yeah, it, I, I, yeah. I definitely say go along for the ride because it's worth it for sure. Well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I, I had an interview, I guess it was last week for The Guardian, where the interviewer, she was, she was lovely. She really liked the book. She said, so I was writing down a list of the things that endure into the year 2203. I wrote down red velvet cake, cupcakes, and misogyny. I was like, all right. That's <laughs> Which, you know, um, it's it's an interesting topic. Um, I have such incredible gratitude for the life that I lead. I feel like it's really extraordinary to be able to do this job. And at the same time, people have said such interesting things to me on book tour, which I wanted to write about. And I'm being very diplomatic and using the word interesting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, all of the all of the all of sections, the the uh, the woman on tour in the year 2203, the all of those interactions are autobiographical. So that's you know, that's, um, I'll lay that out there. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that was kind of leading to maybe one of our other questions, because I felt like um, those really were the sections of the book that stood out for me, the last book tour on Earth sections. Um, and can I give a little bit of a synopsis? So Olive Llewellyn is the author of a very popular novel called Mary and Bad. And that's about a pandemic, and she is on a book tour on Earth as a pandemic exists and is closing in. Um, and the quote from Marion Bad from Olive's book is, we knew it was coming. So that definitely lends to um, the anxiety of the moment. Um, but at different tour stops, Olive is doing interviews and telling bits of smallpox pandemic stories from 1792. And there are all these really brilliant observations. And they were sometimes humorous and sometimes infuriating interactions with the people that she travel, you know, as she travels from stop to stop. And it is where the book feels very intimate. 
because as a reader, we, we do have to assume that this is at least a reflection of your own experiences. So my question here, was it a difficult part of the story to write? Or in the hindsight of your experience, was it something that you were able to have fun with? Because this book section definitely has um, moments of levity amidst the chaos and fear. It was a bit of both. Uh, what made it hard to write was this feeling of walking a tightrope where I don't want to suggest for an instant that I'm ungrateful. You know, I, I'm aware that I have an extraordinary career and an incredible life, and I'm grateful every minute of every day. And yet, <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the book tour experiences are often um, quite surreal. And there is a degree of sexism that one just learns to live with, for better or worse. And it was interesting to write about that. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of those interactions are verbatim. The, the guy standing up to tell me that the death of the prophet was anticlimactic <laughs> climactic in, uh, in Station 11. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I had to tone down a few of those sections, I have to say. <laughs> 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 but which, uh, I, that was probably a wise move on the parts of my editors. Um, you know, it, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier as well in terms of reactions to one's work in the, you know, among general readers. And it's really the same in live events as it is on Twitter, where the overwhelming majority of responses are positive and it's lovely. And I have this feeling of having connected with someone who cared about my work. And that's an extraordinary thing. <laughs> A small percentage of responses could reasonably be summarized as, I can't help but notice that you wrote Station Eleven differently than I would have written Station Eleven, <laughs> which, um, you know, is interesting, but uh, too late. The book's in print. So, yeah, you know, it was, I, I've just been dealing with that range of responses for so many years now. And there was something both a little bit nerve wracking and kind of fun about finally writing about it. Well, it had to be kind of, I would imagine, therapeutic in a way that you're just finally able to like get some of those feelings out there that like, I'm sure that's a super stressful time to be on book tour that you have to like kind of like be on all the time because you're, you know, interacting with everyone and probably reading from your books and all of that. But... Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, one of the pleasures of fiction is that if somebody says something outrageous in real life and you're momentarily stunned into silence and say absolutely <laughs> nothing. Uh, like, for example, the woman in Texas who said to me, you must have a very kind husband to look after your child while you're doing this, which I'll just mm. say as a general comment is probably not something that male business travelers hear terribly often that, you know, in the moment I was just sort of stunned into silence. But in the uh, in the fictional version of that, in the, <laughs> in the auto fiction sections and uh, Sea of Tranquility. Uh, of course, Olive has this devastating line in response. So yeah. that's, that's another aspect of it. You know, the uh, the things you wish you'd said could be said in fiction. Yeah. I was um, really kind of proud of Olive's response. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, yes. I wish I'd thought of it, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a connection in Sea of Tranquility to the narratives of Station Eleven and the Glass Hotel, kind of little parallel universe action. Um, and we've kind of talked about it already that you don't really use an outline for your writing process. Was that true even for this book with kind of pulling elements or characters from previous works? Um, it was true that I didn't have an outline for this book, but there was a book whose structure I wanted to emulate. And that was Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell, which is one of my very favorite novels. And he does something that I didn't quite pull off in Sea of Tranquility, but I came really close, where there's this symmetrical structure that moves forward and then backward in time. So if A is, say, the year 1750, and um, D is the year 2500, with points in between, it could be mapped as A, B, C, D, C, B, A. You know, it goes forward and then back to this mm -hmm. peak in the far future, and then way back in time. And... There's something so appealing to me about the order and symmetry of that structure. So I tried to use it in the Glass Hotel. It absolutely did not work. I had to rethink the whole thing. But I did mostly pull it off in Sea of Tranquility, except for the very final section, Anomaly, kind of is an anomaly for the structure of the novel <laughs> as well as in content. So yeah, there was no outline, but I knew what I wanted to do. So in this case, I didn't need one. 
And then the overlaps and characters, I, you know, it's, it's hard to develop a character. I become a little bit attached to them and that I just continue to find them interesting after a book is published. So in this case, I knew I wanted there to be a section set in approximately 2020. And I just found myself thinking, well, I have people for that. You know, I can bring in these characters from the Glass Hotel and that maps onto their stories in kind of an interesting way. And it's, it's a chance for me to spend more time with these characters and develop their stories a little bit further. And it's also just a ready-made set of characters that I can drop into a given timeline. Sure. I find myself wondering, you know, if I would experience the story in a different way if I had read, you know, Sea of Tranquility first and then The Glass Hotel and then Station Eleven. For anyone who hasn't read your books, is there an order that you would recommend for readers? Uh, No. No, there's no order. Um, I think probably it comes down to your personal preferences around genre where, you know, Station Eleven is literary fiction and also sci-fi. The Glass Hotel is... I don't know. It's about a financial crime, but there's also a ghost story element. I don't know what to call that one. Um, And then Sea of Tranquility is kind of speculative again, although there are elements of historical and contemporary fiction. I think you can read them in any order, honestly. We've had discussions, Kelsey and I, about the kind of art that might be produced as, you know, through this pandemic. And really for me, Um, I think that Sea of Tranquility really shines as an artistic expression of this moment. But I also want to take just a minute to talk about um, the Station Eleven TV series that was recently released on HBO. um, Because honestly, uh, this is some of like the best TV that I feel I've seen in a long time. Um, You know, I don't want to say maybe ever, but yeah, maybe ever. (laughs) Um, But Am I correct that you had no official involvement with the production of the TV series? That is correct. Yeah. Thank you, by the way, for what you just said about Sea of Tranquility. I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, yeah, I had I had no involvement with the production. There was a very early moment years ago when Patrick Somerville, the showrunner and lead writer, called me and you know explained what he wanted to do with it. And Uh, My memory is that he did suggest there could be a place for me in the writer's room, but that was a moment in my life when I had very little interest in writing scripts. So I said, no, I'm busy writing Glass Hotel. Um, You know, you go do your thing. So yeah, I had no official involvement, but I get texts from Patrick every now and again, and I I really loved those little glimpses into the production. And I, you know, I think probably one of my favorite things about that adaptation was the cast. It was really incredibly diverse and they were just fantastic just um, so re- good really yeah. brought the story to life so for yeah, anyone I, I feel, it, sorry I was just gonna say wasn't Danielle Deadweiler incredible the character who plays Miranda I was so mesmerized by that yeah. performance you know the uh, lesser character but um Frank is it Nob and Rizwan I know mm-hmm. um just fantastic and um Himesh Patel, I think they're yeah. great things going to be happening yeah, all of, for him. All of them. Yeah, so yeah. many. Matilda, Lo- Matilda Lawler was yeah. incredible, um, the little kid, and Mackenzie yeah. Davis. Yeah, yeah, there was, And it, I, I guess I guess I'm biased because it's based on my book, yeah. but on the other hand, it had nothing to do with the production, and I just, I feel like all the performances were incredible. Yeah, and it, it is uh, loosely adapted, you know, because yeah. um, the in the TV series the main character relationship doesn't exist in the book but they really do yeah. great things with it they really do and, and you know honestly i wish i'd thought of that <laughs> <laughs> yeah so in station 11 the novel um kirsten and jeevan meet at the theater for oh i don't know 20 minutes and then go their separate ways and we never they never meet up again and then In the series, uh, the way that they decided to have Kirsten just go with Jeevan back to Frank's apartment, that's really smart. I wish I'd thought of that (laughs) plot. So yeah, it it is a loose adaptation. Patrick has described it as an aggressive adaptation, which I don't disagree with. What's become really clear to me over the years is that if you try to just map a book onto the screen, you get a boring TV show. You know, I think that different mediums have very different dramatic requirements and what what works well in a book might not work very well on the screen and vice versa. So I always felt that it was going to be different from the book. And 
I have to say, even though it is very different in a lot of places, it does feel to me to be fundamentally true to the spirit of the book. And to, I, I really, I really love the series. Yeah, I, I, I did, for <laughs> sure. She can't stop talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Neither can I, so I appreciate that. <laughs> so, of course, we couldn't let you go without talking a little bit about the article that you wrote for 538 back in 2016 titled The Gone Girl with the Dragon Tattoo on right. the Train. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Was, I had to practice that, that a couple work. times. <laughs> yeah, I had to uh, I had to hire a data assistant. It was just an incredible amount of <laughs> numbers. Um, but that was really fun. I was, I was an administrative assistant for, I want to say 12 years. And a big part of my job was putting together these very complex grant budgets. Um, it was a cancer research lab. So a lot of grant proposals to try to get funding for cancer research. So that's a long-winded way of saying I had these Excel superpowers. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was really fun to like, open up Excel and like put those powers to work on something like book titles. Sure, yeah. You know, we've even talked about it in other discussions. I think it's even been talked about like in the library break room about how, you know, we talked about that you brought data to the discussion on just why there might be so many books with girl in the title. So now, yeah. almost six years later, do you think much of that data still rings true? Do you have any new thoughts on the subject? You know, it's a good question. Um, to be honest with you, something that's very different about my life now from six years ago is that now I have a six-year-old. So, <laughs> uh, I'm busy. Um, yeah, yeah I, I feel like I'm a little less plugged into the book world, broadly speaking, than I used to be, just as a bandwidth issue that, you know, I... I write constantly and when I'm not writing, I'm, I'm with my daughter and I just find, I, I feel like I know less about the book world now than I did six years ago. I'm just a little bit, um, tuned out, just not enough hours in the day. Um, I don't know if the situation's changed. Um, it seems to me, and I haven't read this piece in a long time, but it seems to me that at the time I wrote it, there had recently been a number of blockbuster books with girl in the title, which I think absolutely has a trickle down effect that, mm -hmm. you know, that can, that can make editors uh, suggest to their authors that, you know, maybe we want to go out to market with a title that's a little bit reminiscent of Gone Girl or the girl on the train or the girl with the dragon tattoo, you know, put a girl in the title, see if it helps sales, <laughs> that kind of that kind of feeling. So, yeah, it, it seems to me there haven't been a ton of those books lately, but um, on the other hand, I shouldn't say that because I'm not sure. Well, I think um, what we observe as seeing new books on the shelf in the library is there are a lot of variations on the theme. So right. woman, wife, sister mother-in-law mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah of, all of yeah. those things come into the title kind of those like just general like female titles or female relationships a friend of mine had this great line she described that genre of title as the interesting man's lady friend that's the, <laughs> that's the genre <laughs> oh, that's good that's a good friend <laughs> yeah um so we you have mentioned that you have been a reader you are a reader um and you mentioned that Cloud Atlas was a book that really stood out for you. Um, are there any other books that stood out for you in 2021? Or are there any books that you can't wait to get your hands on in 2022? Oh, there's a book I just read that I loved called Night Boat to Tangier. I might be mispronouncing that. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say that city out loud by Kevin Barry. And book, it had yeah. this wonderful kind of looping structure and this really unique voice and it was really moving. It's about these two Irish gangsters trying to track down this young woman who it's not quite clear which of the gangsters is the father, but they have this familial connection to her in this kind of seedy ferry terminal in Spain. And yeah, it, it sounds boring when I describe it, but I, I found it wonderful. Um, yeah, so that was a book that I loved in the last couple of months. A book that I'm really looking forward to is um, Jennifer Egan's new novel, which I think yeah. releases the same date as Sea of Tranquility. Oh. And I just love her work. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. And that's kind of a, um, is it a, a sequel or a follow up to A Visit from the Goon Squad? I think um, I think they are I don't, yeah. related. I don't know that much about about it maybe kind of an alternate universe sci-fi take i'm sure i shouldn't speculate about someone else's book yeah I'm not well, sure but that's kind of the sense i've gotten to it right i am i'm looking, looking forward, forward to reading to it. it i'm a fan yeah. well we definitely want to recommend that 
readers pick up Sea of Tranquility. Um, it is, I, I think it's going to end up being one of my favorite books of this year for sure. For sure. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's okay. really been an honor and a pleasure to talk with you today, Emily. Thank you for joining us on the first 50 pages. <laughs> my pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much.